So let's dig right in. I, Paul, I'm looking across the index buckets right now. NASDAQ's down 17%, S&P 10. ARC, interestingly, Kathy Woods Venture is down 65%. Um, and the EFI are all down 18%. I've read your recent newsletter, and it appears that you think from here there's quite a bit more downside. Do I get that right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, and, and this is this is not a, a question of the merits of individual companies or anything like that. It's just that you know we've been selling at valuations according to Robert Schiller's uh, secular uh, adjusted. Uh, P, P ratio, the CAPE ratio, we were selling at 38 times normal earnings, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty rich by anybody's standards, mm -hmm. particularly when the historical average is 15. So you could say without any problems, you would expect over a period of time that we would come back to around the average. Um, so yeah, that, that's, you know, that's kind of what we see as a backdrop. Well, okay, you say, you know, what's the catalyst for that? Well. I think there's a catalyst in, in what's going on in Russia. And, you know, people are still, people are still, to my mind, in a state of denial about this. They keep thinking, you know, Jim Cramer last, last week, oh, this is all going to be over in two hours. Guys, yeah. have you not spotted what happened? Napoleon, Hitler, and so on. These things do not, this is not a video game that finishes in 30 minutes and we all go off for a beer. Yeah, no, I, I look, it, it's sobering, the reality, and I understand, you know, the parallels there. I'm, I, I guess, from a tactical standpoint, there's, I, I've got a lot of questions around. Let's start with what you think um, Vladimir Putin's motivations are, and what do you think uh, his end game is here? What does he want to accomplish in the big picture? I think he's been very clear for 10, 20 years. Uh, he regards the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the Soviet Union, who I mean, as, quotes, the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century. He wants to restore it. So that means, it, by, by that logic, um, it means that he doesn't stop at Ukraine, that there's going to be a series of other places that he goes through. Yeah. So oh, yeah. let, let me ask you the counterpoint to that. I mean, it's not to say that he's just, you know, that, that if, if he were to take Ukraine, you know, at some point, that's not to say he would then go straight on, right? Uh, but he you know, he does, uh, as we as as we say in the report uh, today, you know, his his tactic is to move forward, stop, look around, see how it's going, adjust, move forward again. But there's you know there's a lot of pieces to this, right? You and I had a conversation mm -hmm. recently about perhaps he miscalculated around the economic re reprisal of his actions specifically the SWIFT and more, maybe more than the SWIFT is the central bank actions where it, it appears that, you know, more than half of his war chest of $630 billion in central bank assets have essentially been frozen. Is that your perception of where we're at with that stuff right now? Well, I, I think once you get into any kind of war, uh, as, as they say, uh, as, as they say in boxing, you know, no, no, no plan survives being punched in the mouth. And you know, uh, so 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 plans plans go wrong. The Ar Russian army uh, is not, you know, what one of the world's strongest. Uh, it's not one of the world's most modern. It doesn't have the, you know, the best trained people, soldiers in it, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you know, it's always likely to be upset in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the the point about Russia uh, and the Soviet Union is that they absorb. A lot of punishment, and you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't use the uh, you know N N Napoleon uh, c c coming c coming through in, uh, in two hundred years ago or Hitler uh, at uh, at Leningrad uh, lightly. Uh, you know, you and you had Stalin. You know, tens of millions of people died uh, with forced collectivization, the gulags, and so on. So um, you 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 can't assume that Russia will stop just because of pain. And this, I think, is a very interesting question for investors, because there's a kind of assumption that if we cut Putin off, then that will be difficult for him to maintain his, uh, his, his forces. And to an extent, it will. But on the other hand, if 
suppose the, the idea of cutting off uh, purchases of Russian oil and gas, what does that do to the ordinary citizen? In that which means, country? Yeah, we in go the for, country uh, or in other countries? Outside, outside Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all, we're all we're all rah rah about. Oh yes, let's go. So okay, so now we go back to 1974, and we have the lines outside the gas stations, and we have the certain number of hours a day for uh, for power cuts and so on and so forth. Uh, now, it, you know, it, it, does that still, you know, encourage people to want to go on with this? Putin's gamble is you're all weak and woke, and you've got no morals, not not moral spine. You'll crumble. All I have to do is sit out. I mean, I, I understand that mentality, but I, I think that's, from my standpoint, that, that that's likely a miscalculation. Um, you know, things move faster today, so we can, there are things that could be done to adjust. Um, may, maybe, you know, the energy I understand. I mean, is I, it, it looks like, you know, Russia provides something like 80% of energy to Europe. So, it seems like this particular piece is a bigger issue for Europe, at least for the time being, um, than it is for the United States. Not to say that we're not all intertwined, because I, I think it bleeds over into the financial markets. I, I'm curious about this. Do you, the way I the way I'm perceiving this, and you know, you I, I default to your expertise. I'm just drawing. You know, I, I try to draw my opinions based on research of other th people that I think are pretty smart and then connecting the dots and trying to apply my own critical thinking. Um, and so when I see this, it makes me wonder um, a couple things. One, um, as far as the way that Ukraine ends up, is it conceivable or likely even that it gets split? Like he gets some portion of it that, that, that kind of accomplishes his short term goals and the rest of Ukraine, because I, I just find it nearly impossible to believe that he'll be able to control 140 million people with limited both military and financial resources to do so. You can you can take over the land, but you can't take over the people, right? I mean, I think that's, is that really what his end goal is? And if so, it seems like that's not really a likely scenario. No, no I, 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 I do disagree with you there, so 40 million people and uh, you know, he's he wants to recreate the Soviet Union. But how do you do well, that when you've got 140 million? I believe, doesn't Ukraine have 140 million people as far as the population? 40. 40. 40 million? Yeah, I think. Okay. So I, I, I apologize. I got that number wrong. Um, so even with 40 million people, I mean, how do you how do you control that many people if you don't necessarily, maybe he does have the resources, but it seems to me that their resources are somewhat limited relative to what you would need to be able to completely control that society and not constantly be under attack and, you know, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, sabotage, things like that. It just seems unlikely that they could occupy the entire country of Ukraine. Well, I, 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 I think in a way, you know, we're, we're almost diving down a, a rabbit hole here, Terry, because you're, you're, you're imputing Kind of normal motives to him, <laughs> well, and, I, and I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's got them. I, I, I think he, you know, I, I keep coming back to this point. You know, he believes in restoring the, you know, the, the, the former Soviet Union. So, okay, this might take five years. This might take ten years. Mm -hmm. This might take twenty years. Got it. Right. You know, but every time somebody comes out and does a bit of sabotage, you shoot them, and you know, after a while. But there aren't 44 million anymore. You know, he's already he's already lost one and a half million, two million. They've gone. Uh, you know, see, so you know, there there is there is the concept of you know he's just going to take the territory if he can. Mm -hmm. And well, I, th I think you know I think the the, the the interesting points from an investor point of view are what what is the impact of today's high oil price on the economy? Nobody seems to be talking about this, but it is blindingly obvious if you look at history that we are now in recession i mean we've already got the atlanta fed gdp now mm -hmm. indicator last week saying gdp first quarter is zero percent that, that you know we are going into a major recession what happens when they withdraw from swift the russians are thrown out of swift which i think takes place next, next week and suddenly there's a whole lot of people who are expecting money out of russia who don't get it. Mm -hmm. 
what happens to, to the 20% of companies in the, in the US S&P 500, which have never been able to pay their interest bills out of revenue and profit. They've only been able to survive by rolling on their, uh, their, their debt. So you know, we, we need to borrow another 5 million. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bernanke. Yes, now we can, uh, we, we can borrow again at an even lower rate. So we keep you know, these, these zombie companies. All of those things are now facing you know, a wake up call. You know, and I can't stress this too, too strongly, that people imagine that the Federal Reserve is still going to be there. And they're not quite sure why Jay Powell hasn't quite come in yet. But maybe it's because he hasn't been confirmed as, 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 as chairman. Uh, maybe it's because he's waiting. It's no longer minus 10 percent. So I think the Fed is a very, very unreliable friend in the markets. At the end of the day, the proper role of central banks is one, to safeguard the currency and B, to fight inflation. Now, we're going to have 10 percent inflation in the States and most places by, by the summer. Can you really believe that Jay Powell is going to continue printing money and saying to Joe Manchin and everybody else, oh, don't worry about inflation, it's only temporary and so on. No, he's now going to go back. He's going to pivot to that traditional role. So investors expecting buckets of money to support them, one morning are going to wake up and have a very nasty surprise, I think. And there is this, this role, you know, what we, we talked in an earlier uh, news report, around the domino effect. One mm -hmm. goes, and you stop, and you pause, and then the next one goes. And each time people say, oh yes, but that was, there yeah. is a pattern. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand your line of thinking. I guess I, it, it raises questions. And um, and if I could challenge a little bit, you, you mm. know more about this topic than I do, but I'm gonna throw you some challenges that I've read about or thought about and I'm sure there's a good answer. I just don't know what it is, which is why I'm asking, right? So <laughs> you could make an argument that um, it's not low interest rates that are creating this inflation right now, that it's a series of other things. And that raising interest rates doesn't really fix the problem because it's not really demand driven. If anything, these higher prices are going to destroy demand and you're going to get them. You're going to get some of this anyway because of the shortages, right? Mm. So there's that's less about demand and more about supply, frankly. Yeah. And, and so the argument would be, why would they then um, really aggressively raise interest rates or try to protect the dollar necessarily when they don't need to. It's not, it's not required. If anything, what they need to do is kind of stabilize an economy and try to find a balance. And so when you look at what the Fed's, the Fed, it seems recently anyway, and again, this is probably your point. So maybe I'm making your point for you in this, because I might be, um, but because it, it, I think this ties back to your thoughts about the Bernanke Fed, which is he added what appeared to be a third mandate, which is financial stability or financial market stability. And I think what you're suggesting here is that that's gone, that basically mm -hmm. that mentality is no longer existent. And so if you take that out, you're left with defending the currency and you're left with you know protecting against inflation, okay? So, and I, I understand that, but my, my counter argument to that would be that I just think there would be so much pressure politically um, to, to be put on the Fed to try to stabilize the situation. Um, and I guess until it's proven that it's different this time, I actually have a hard time believing it because that's counter to what the Fed has done at all for the last 25 years. Does that make sense? Well, that's, uh, we see where I disagree with you is I think that in 1999, Bernanke got worried about Y2K. Some of you, uh, I remember, you know, right? You know, uh, and which I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, he was wrong to get worried about it because, after all, yeah, you know, all the major companies, all the governments, and so on, had ensured that the clocks would tick over and planes wouldn't fall out of the sky. But okay, you can understand that you, know, you might want to have a bit of money there in order, just in case an ATM doesn't work or whatever. Fine. So you then get the end. You know, that leads you to the dot com bubble. That should have been a remarkably strong warning to you, never ever try, try and throw money at financial markets. 
But of course, yeah, Greenspan then took it on and said, oh, no, no, we can now, uh, uh, you know, we were having a recession, we're in danger of the recession. So let's instead do subprime because house prices across the states can never fall. And so let's do, let's do that. Of course, we know where that ended up. Now, what Bernanke did was he took that to another level because he announced in November 2010 uh, in the Washington Post after a Fed meeting, essentially, he, he said, what's good for the stock market is good for the US economy. He said, no, we believe that if we can keep the stock market moving up, then there is, in the end, a trickle down effect where everybody does well. Now, you can debate why he came up with this. There's a very good, uh, very good book uh, just recently out, which charts it, uh, Lord of Easy Money. Uh, if anybody wants to have a sort of read of it on Kindle, which goes through, it takes to to Thomas, to Thomas Hoenig, the, uh, the president of the Kansas City Fed, as, as the guy who just put forward the, this is madness. If you do this, Chairman, you are going to cause the mother of all financial crises. He was sidelined side and, uh, and ignored, uh, as you would expect. But we, we've now got that financial, potentially that financial crisis. And it doesn't, it's not that the Fed can do anything about it. Supposing the Fed decided to put another two trillion into the stock market. Mm -hmm. Well, how much has come out of the global economy with oil prices going to $130 and gas prices go? Gas prices in the UK, which were 50p, half a UK pound, uh, you know, th four weeks ago, were six pounds today. So more than 10 times higher. Mm -hmm. Now, what, you know, what, what can an individual family do? You have to heat your home. You mm -hmm. have to drive to work. You have to take the kids to school and so on and so forth. You haven't got any money left to spend on the discretionary items that drive the economy. That's taken up. There, you know, there is no way of the world, even if Bernanke and Greenspan came back together and turned that printing press as hard as they could, there's no way in the world they can cope with that. And that's only one of the particular dominoes that is falling at the moment. So it's your. it sounds like, you know, it's your argument that that fuel and fuel related costs are going to eat up such a large percentage of the average consumer's budget that it's just not going to leave enough money for other what we'll call normal discretionary type spending and so as a result you know in, in the united states as you know consumer spending represents about 70 percent of gdp so there's some what we what we would perceive to be exponential decrease in the consumer spending that's going to take place as a result of all this and that's where it leads to recession and prices falling um and and then there's really at this point i think what you're saying is the fed doesn't have legitimate policy tools um to to be able to correct that problem no i mean it's just, it's just out, out, you know it, it, it's not above its pay grade it's just nowhere near um, it, it's pay grade. It's the it's the return to a more cyclical economy, and mm -hmm. it would have helped if the Fed hadn't done the stupidity of the last ten or fifteen years and built up the bubbles that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we are where we are. I mean, the 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 the, the issue here, here is is simply that if you look back at history, whenever oil prices get to be more than three percent of GDP, mm -hmm. you go into recession. Yep. But what happens? On the, on the way up, it's counterintuitive because as they go up, what happens in the value chain? Everybody who, see, who buys fuel or buys products that are based on oil or buys trucking or whatever, anything in the value chain, they all say, well, look, this is, this is the 7th, 7th of March. We know it's going to be higher tomorrow, so we'll buy more today. And so for a while, and this is where we've been now for a month or so, Prices have been moving up, but it looks as though demand is quite strong because people are busy putting in what we would call precautionary stock. It's a perfectly logical, sensible thing to do. But at some point, the purchasing guy has a meeting with his sales guy and she says to him, you know, actually, Jim, we're not getting the orders anymore. Ah, and the finance director says, you know, I think we ought just to downsize our inventory a bit mm -hmm. so let's take a pause for a couple of weeks and the pause for a couple of weeks turns into a pause for a month mm -hmm. now you've lost 10 percent of demand 
I yeah, no, I, I can see how it's, and then you obviously people start losing jobs, right? Because companies yeah. have to cut back. And so it, it you know, eventually it feeds on itself. And, until, and, and corporate corporate earnings go down. I mean, don't, don't forget that what we've also got here is a, you know, we already had uh, a lot of supply, supply chain chaos because of the shipping issues, because of the, the ports, because of the trucker shortages, all of these things. You know, so we already have these problems and now we've got them in spades. Because you know, if you if you look at what, what we've got, any you know, car companies who you know five, 10, 20 years ago set up part supply from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you know, well, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I mean, in in, 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 in Germany there were a hundred thousand Ukrainian truck drivers. They've all gone back to fight. Mm -hmm. So how you know, how do you how do you find another hundred thousand you know, obviously across Europe there's more. And so on and so forth. So there's, there's, there's all these knock-on effects. Yep. But all I'm really encouraging people to do is to think about what are the potential interconnections rather than just saying, oh, I don't have to think about it because Powell's going to look after me. Supposing the good fairy isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand your point. And, you know, this is sort of the fragility of massively global supply chain that has not one point of failure, but many points of failure at this point. But it's like a, it's a line of Christmas lights, right? Except where the one light can take the whole chain out now, right? So that's the problem with anything like this is that you, you've centralized so much of it in a way that it's all on one line. Whereas if we were a little more agile, and, and I think, you know, if you go back and look, this is in part what Donald Trump uh, in part, anyway, what he campaigned on in the very beginning was that we're too reliant on the global this or that for our economy, for our independence, and so forth. Um, and now we're starting to see some of the, you know, some of that come to pass. And obviously, at that point, he had no idea that COVID would happen and play out the way it did. So, you know, that was an entirely different animal unto itself. And, you know, that, that Paul, that, this, you, you just, you're an excellent student of history. So I really appreciate, I don't have to read anything. I can just come and ask you. It's great. You're like the you know, living TLDR, right? Too long, didn't read. I'll just ask Paul. <laughs> so one thing that strikes me as, is interesting. Okay. I, I, I think based on what I'm seeing, I don't really think, um, I don't think Biden or the Biden administration would really mind if Zelensky was removed from office. Um, they do, just don't seem to, and the reason that I say that is because number one, um, I don't think that they've really taken the action. So for example, with the SWIFT system, right? That doesn't, I mean, that's an inconvenience to Russia, but it doesn't stop them from transacting business because all it, they can pick up a phone and do transfers. The SWIFT system is electronic. So the yeah. money can actually, it's not illegal to move the money. You just can't use the SWIFT system to do it as yeah. I understand it, okay? So they didn't really cut them off. They just slowed it down a little bit. We continue to buy a, a ton of oil from them, right? And so it seems to me, it's like a bifurcated message. On one hand, we're acting tough and we're doing all this stuff. But if you remember, Trump's impeachment started with the Zelensky phone call. Right. And yeah. there was an argument to be made that there was a lot of corruption in Ukraine and that somehow the Biden administration was tied to it, or at least the Biden family. Right. Because if you go back to the Zelensky phone call, it was about Trumping at Trump asking about Hunter Biden, regardless yeah. of whether any of that's true or not. I think it was widely accepted that um, Ukraine was a hub for what we'll call just total corruption. Right. It just seemed like it prior to Zelensky. Zelensky got elected on this idea that he was going to clean up the corruption. Again, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But I find it interesting that, um, that the Biden administration hasn't like, I mean, there's the strong messaging about- But, 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 but Timmy, I, I, I really think you're wrong here. I might be. You are walking a tightrope with a dangerous autocrat yep. who has already threatened nuclear war. Yep. He's already threatened nuclear war. He's got the largest fleet of nuclear weapons, 6,000 of them, in the world. Now, there are people who say, oh, we should enforce a no-fly zone. If you shot down a Russian plane or you shot up a, a Russian tank, you would have nuclear warheads into DC 
and Michigan and everywhere else within the four minutes. This is serious. This is not a this is not a game. You are dealing with a man who may well be not quite there, who certainly has ideas which are manic. Whether he's manic himself, we don't know. But you have to play very, very, very carefully. And so there is a NATO rule of Article 5, which says an attack on one NATO uh, member is an attack on all. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, mm -hmm. has not been, you know, that you go back, I'm afraid, to Dick Cheney and George Bush. They were the ones who started, st started this. They made this unsolicited offer to uh, Ukraine. Why did they do that? We don't know. It just sounded good. You know, just a gesture, right? Okay, well, now 15 years, 17 years later, we're now getting the fruits of that. Thank you very much, I, George I, W. Bush. I, Thank you very much, the late Dick Cheney. I, I yeah. So this has been going on a long time. Corruption, Paul, don't you? I mean, to me, it seems yes, like... Yeah, but, 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 but you, you're, the, 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 point, the point is, is uh, are Biden and Blinken supposed to stand back and do nothing? No. Are they supposed to go in with the Sixth Fleet and the Armored Corps? No. no. No, it's not our fight. And they do. Right. Yeah. So so you so you you've got well, to go you stop buying the oil, couldn't yeah. you, Paul? I mean they, they could there's well, all right. So so if so, so but if you stop buying the oil, then the lights go out across large parts of Europe, including Germany. So you're what I think I'm hearing you say is that this is in deference to our allies that we're trying to find, walk a very, very small tightrope here between doing what we can and not creating great pain and great difficulty for Europe. Well, we give them time to adjust, resupply, do what they need to do, and then redouble our efforts somewhere down the road and fight the fight down there. No, I mean, diplomacy, as practiced by Kissinger and James Baker, people who knew what they were doing is not about issuing threats mm -hmm. diplomacy is about trying to manage within very very difficult and narrow uh, path pathways is german public opinion any seven days ago that german public opinion was told by the chancellor in sunday's bundestag speech we are now going to rearm germany only on sunday last week got away from the history, finally, of World War II, where it said, no, no, we can't ever have arms, because if we do, God knows what we might do, right? So, so we're, we're seven days into that. We've got massive public support, clearly, for uh, Ukraine, you know, people turning up at the Berlin rail, railway station, offering them homes, and mm -hmm. so on, a, a, a wonderful thing. But does that translate into, by the way, I'm sorry, we haven't got any power for your factory, so you've just lost your, you, you've just lost your, uh, your job. By the way, your school is shut because we haven't got any power. By the way, you can only have power for your home for a couple of hours. Have we got to that point yet? Because if we haven't, it's very, very dangerous to move forward with what sounds about, oh, we're going to come up, right? Because immediately people are going to say, well, hang on, I didn't vote for that. <laughs> you've got to give people time. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I understand. I mean, this is... This because, is a... because we're not a totalitarian... Putin can do whatever he likes in Russia. But if you don't like it, he'll either shoot you or arrest you or throw you out of a window. Mm -hmm. right. No, I, I mean, so do you do you think there's I mean, do you do you think if given enough time, there's any chance that his regime crumbles from within? Uh, well, I, I, I think the the issue with regime change in any totalitarian system is more hope of, than, than reality. Mm -hmm. Because by this time, all the people who might have been suspect have been weeded out. Mm -hmm. So you've only got a very small, hardcore of people. You know, you've got the oligarchs, who are the people who you know, made the money out of him, and you've got the strong men. And the strong men are the ones you want to worry about because they're the people who were in the KGB with him. They're the Siloviki. As they call in, uh, in 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 St Petersburg and Leningrad before that, and they are hard men. So, you know, is any one of them? Going to, you know, they're kind of the Praetorian Guard. Yeah. Any one of them going to take him out? I would think that's unlikely. Is he going to die? 
well, we're all going to die at some point. Yeah, there are rumours that he got cancer, which is why uh, his face is all swollen up because he's been treated with the steroids and so on. Well, if, 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 if he is, does that make it better or worse? Because if he's going to die, why shouldn't he push the button? I, I mean, it's, we'll never know what goes on inside yeah. his head. Um, if he does push the button, then the legacy for Russia is over, right? There's nothing left. Oh, yeah, but he's got, he's got it, you know. Well, he's, no, he's, I, he's, he's, he's achieved for that, you know. You, you know demented people are demented, Terry. He Not like you and I say, wait a minute, you know, there's no beer for us tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand. I mean, I, I think they're, you know, I guess we'll... I guess time will tell as to how that plays out. It, um, I, in the big picture, I, I think this is a complicated scenario, and it sounds to me like you're very much in favor of the diplomacy that's taken on to this point. Just kind of let this play out a little longer, but you don't give us a lot of hope on the front that um, it, it sounds to me, and maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on this, but it sounds to me, Paul, like you've you've kind of surmised that this is essentially World War III. That's where we're at right now. No, 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 no. You, you took me down that path. I, I don't, look, I, I came through the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. right? I spent 10 days where every morning, my parents, like all the other school kids in London, kissed, kissed, kissed me goodbye and said, we hope to see you again tonight, darling. And I went to school mm -hmm. and I came back. And we had a reunion at school. And this was the first thing we discussed, how this had happened to us. And a lot of buried memories came back. But of course, the point was that our parents had lived like that for five years during the Blitz. That while they were sleeping, they could be blown up by a bomb. While they were out at work, while they were going to the shops, whatever, they could all be. So, so, so you just carry on. Mm -hmm. So I'm very optimistic because if you've survived the Cuban Missile Crisis, well, there's actually nothing worse. You know, that's it. You, you, know, you, you could leave and not come back. So, so I'm very optimistic. And the, the other point I want to make is we've made a fantastic number of mistakes. You know, a lot of the problems we've got today are due to our mistakes. They are not due to other people. We should never have done what we did in Russia in the 90s. We should never have allowed all of that oligarchs to come through. We should never have allowed Putin to carry on poisoning enemies and so on as we did. We didn't do any of that. And we shouldn't have stirred up all the problems with Islam and everything else. We shouldn't have lost our place in the world. We shouldn't have built up financial bubbles, etc. So we've got a lot of unwinding to do. But I am optimistic, I'm very optimistic that over the next 10 to 20 years, assuming we come through this, and I do assume we come through this, and I, I don't want to worry anybody. I just want to say, look, this is where we are. You know, it's, it's just, that is it. Uh, but if I look forward, what I can see is that this new normal world, this green revolution that we're having, getting back to a much more local, much more sustainable environment, where we take much more care, and we don't have all these bullies around us shouting and screaming on social media and Fox News, and so on. I think that will take us forward. And there's some very good medium to long term. We're doing advisory work uh, for an IPO, which is happening this week uh, in London for a recycling company. And you say, well, how can you possibly be? Well, the investors we're talking to are some of the big names. You know, I said, look, markets go up and down. What we're worried about is will this company be earning money and able to pay dividends and so we can pay pensions in five, 10, 20 years time? And the answer is yes. If you look at the recycling markets, for example. So, you know, I, I really wouldn't want people to panic. I would just want them to say, okay, yeah, I can see it. It's going, but something I can do about it. So, you know, what's the point of panicking? You know, it just oh, it doesn't get you anywhere, right? Just look, no. look at it. I would take a very, very defensive position with my portfolio. Mm -hmm. I would not assume Jay Powell is going to be the fairy godmother to rescue us. And then I would say, well, now, uh, where do I think the good opportunities are? Go back, Peter Lynch. You know, Peter Lynch, one of the great investors, you know, one up on Wall Street, always said, look, individuals get a much better handle on what's, what's happening long before Wall Street tumbles to it. Now, I, I really appreciate your insights on that. So it sounds like there's, so there's, I have two questions and then I know you've got other things to get to. I've got to go, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the simple first question is, um, do you think, uh, do you have, do you see any role for uh, cryptocurrency in, in this new world? Do you think that it survives the regulatory onslaught um, and will it have a place? I can't, I, can't, I can't see what it does for us. 
Uh, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know who's behind it. I, it has no clear value on its own. You know, if, 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 you, if you send me some Bitcoin today, at what, 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 what price is it? What is it worth to one? That's not a currency. All it's doing is legitimizing, really, uh, tra tra uh, you know, uh, black market traffic. Um, so I, I'm afraid, you know, it, it's a speculative bubble. Uh, it could go on for longer. I mean, you know, it could go from a, a thousand to fifty thousand or whatever. You know, uh, but I don't think it has a it has a role in life. So it's yeah, to, to me, I, I don't see you know, Bitcoin is a tool for speculation. It seems like mm -hmm. part. But I think if you look at the use case, I mean, the argument is, is that um, it kind of solves some of the other problems that, uh, you know, for example, the, the SWIFT issue, or, you know, if you're a Russian citizen and you've got money in rubles, what do you do with it? If you convert it to a cryptocurrency, it's outside the system. And at least you can somewhat safeguard the value and, and be able to use it in some way for transactions. Uh, maybe not necessarily right then and there, but certainly in other places and, um, and in the future. That's the argument anyway. I'm not saying that, yeah. that right or wrong. I think time will tell. I, I, so it, you, it sounds like you don't like the concept, but more importantly, you but don't- what, 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 what I would worry about, you may remember we wrote about this last month, uh, is the, uh, the so-called stable coins. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you, you, you know, there's, there's people put cream off money at every stage. It's a bit like buying an insurance policy. Uh, you know, you pay you pay a penny here and a couple of pennies there and three pennies there, and you think, wait a minute, uh, where did all my money go? Well, once you've made twenty percent, you'll be able to cover it. Oh, okay, fine, thanks. What? Um, and uh, you know, if you want to invest in a in a in a cryptocurrency, you have to buy a stable coin, and you've got things like Tether. Well, you know, te Tether it woefully underreports what's mm -hmm. happening. Is it actually holding real dollars against that dollar you give it, or is it holding commercial paper? If it's holding commercial paper, where is it actually? What commercial paper is it holding? Is it, you know, General Motors and Ford and so on, or is it Chinese, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, property developers? Uh, you know, I, I, I think that's going to be a potential big issue for the future. I would be cautious. Yeah, I, I see that. I, you don't, but you don't need stable coins to transact in Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. You can convert. Well, they've got up to sixty or seventy billion, haven't they? So. Yeah, no, there's a lot of money there, but I, I think people, I, I, you know what, people have drunk the Kool-Aid on that to some extent, and so they perceive that to be a, a place that's safer than it is. I don't trust that part of it, but I, I do think, you know, in the long run, something like, th there's a place for something like Bitcoin, because as you can see, based on what's happening in the world today, there are people that are looking for a, a use case for money that's outside of state control. You know, and there's there's a lot of people. There, there are. I, 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 you know, I, 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 you know the, the only way you're outside of state control is if you're in the hands of the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right. And so, lastly, then, from an investment standpoint, this is where we'll leave it because I really appreciate your time and your insights. Um, you know, right now, obviously, cash is king. I think we can make that argument. It's it's sitting on the sidelines. <clears throat> you can make a short-term trade to try to benefit from the energy in the wheat and some of that kind of stuff. But if you're not a trader, you know, that's really going to be a difficult game to play. So if you're, if you're someone that's 60 years old and close to retirement or, or maybe retired right now, um, and you've got a portfolio of a million dollars, and this is your life savings, right? So this is where most of your future income is going to come from. Um, how would you have set that up right now? What percentage would be in cash and whatever's not in cash, where would it be? Well, I, I, the, the way, way I start to answer that is to say that the best way to think about this is, am I comfortable with what, I, what I've got today? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I'm not ter sleeping terribly well, then as Warren Buffett says, you know, the thing to do is to cut back until you start sleeping well. Okay. And, you know, everybody has a different, different perception of risk. I think that equities in general are very highly valued mm -hmm. and at some point will come back to the, a more normal valuation. I also think that today is one of those moments when there's quite a big risk that we may have a catalyst to make that move take place. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you're not bothered about that risk, then that's fine. I, that, but that's, you know, that, that's my first answer, that I wouldn't be in equities at the moment. Would I be in gold? 
Yeah, I'd probably be in, a, in gold, uh, simply because it is a store of value. I think gold is a more reliable store of value than Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, can, I, I know who produces gold. I know where it is. I can produce some numbers on it and so on and so forth. So I think stores of value are quite good. Would I, would I be buying treasury bonds and so on? I could see a case for that. I, I can see interest rates going higher though. Mm -hmm. So I would start to be a bit more cautious about treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. But if you're buying short-term bonds and just rolling them over, the, the question is, how much risk do you want here? Do you want, do you want to you know, say, oh, I'm going to buy the dip and buy the 30-year bond on the basis that it's going down? Well, if you're very, very you know, inclined to be risk on that, that's fine. I, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd go for shorter term. Mm -hmm. uh, shorter term my, myself um, and and what I would do I think the best advice in that I've got at the moment is to avoid buying the dips mm -hmm. that what we will see and I've been a trader so uh, yeah this comes from personal experience if you're a trader and if your company is paying you to trade these markets 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year you know an awful lot about what's happening in the market. And if you're a big player, and I was working for a very big company, one of the biggest companies in the world in the area that I was, I was operating down in, in Houston, and you know, you've got a lot of information that most people don't have, and you play games. Because I want to get to a certain position, and I need you, Terry, it's a nice guy and so on, to think that my real position is this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not lying, I never lie. Because once you lie, that's it. You know, you can't be half broken. I never lie. But I might give you, unfortunately, the impression that. And there's hundreds of news reporters now. Or, you know, my day, we had five reporters that we could bamboozle. Now you've got 24-hour reporters to bamboozle. Most of whom have got no experience of any of this. So you can just drop a sort of small hint about, well, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm feeling a bit worried about all this. <gasps> oh, right. Now, you know, I told you. I think, oh, right, okay, so I now push that. Now I can sell because I wasn't really very comfortable with that position. I just wanted to pop up a bit. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, and these are the tricks of the trade because, after all, if you're a trader, you're there for your bonus at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. You're not there to help the market. If a trader tells the, you know, the, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or the Financial Times, oh, you know, you have to ask. <laughs> He's talking his position. He's not, He's not telling you because he wants to give you good advice. It's not like you, Terry. Not like you sort of trying to struggle your way through. He's saying, look, you know, I want the market to go that way. So, you know, you can help me. It makes perfect um, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know. it, it's a dog eat dog world, right? I mean, let's yeah, face it, yeah. this is, it's a big boy's business and you mm -hmm. have to know that going in. You, you know, from, from our perspective, we went pretty heavily into cash in January. Um, and so we've we've taken a little bit of a drawdown, relatively speaking. If you have any exposure, you have you have had to take some, but I think we're we're reasonably well insulated. And I and I guess the last question I'll ask is just really simple: Where, where do you think? Where, where would you be a buyer of equities? Uh, where where do, what does that look like for you? Or what were what would some of the signals be that it's okay to start drifting back in? Well, you see, I I think that we're going to get back to a world of investment. Uh, the world that I, I grew up with from the, in the 1980s and, and 90s, where you actually look at individual companies and you look at earnings and you focus on areas where, which you understand. Right. You know? uh, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? I mean, obviously, you just go for momentum these days, but you know, that's what we used to do. And, you know, so and, and you would form a view of management and you would follow them and you'd say, well, you know, uh, Dow Chemical, uh, yeah, pretty good management, pretty good base of business, uh, selling at a fairly low PE ratio. But yeah, I think I'll I'll take a punt on them. Uh, or you know, Lando Barzell, or you know whatever, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, take you know, whatever company you want. So you, because in the, in the old days, earnings and the stock price used to run together over a five or ten year period. Mm -hmm. That was what you did. So if you could if you could form a judgment, uh, you know, as Ben Graham. Uh, told us all those years ago, take a form of judgment, because the market has always been this difference between a weighing machine and a voting machine. Mm -hmm. Now, I am a weighing machine kind of, uh, of investor. So in other words, I weigh up the fundamentals 
And I say, you know, Terry's a pretty good guy. I know he's perfectly straight. I know that he's running a good business and he's got good people and he's actually got very enthusiastic clients who like buying his products. And actually, people don't seem to like what Terry's doing at the moment. So that's a bit of an opportunity. Now, the other kind of investor would be saying, oh, look, I see everybody's voting against Terry. They don't think he's doing very well. So I can go on the downside and I can make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. well, both types of investors can make money for a period. You have to decide what, what you fancy. I prefer, I prefer investing in my friend Terry and sticking it out because I think he'll produce good results in the end. So that, that you know, it's an approach, if you like. But as I say, the green revolution to me, there's a lot of hype around it at the moment. It may be, well be overvalued in certain cases. But fundamentally, you know, somebody like Mary Barra at GM, mm -hmm. she, she knows what she's doing. She's going to come through. Now, you may say the price is too high today. Probably is. But the, 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 vol the volume and, the, and the, the profits will come through there. So it, what it sounds like, Paul, we're, we're going back to actually doing fundamental research where, where it's, it's a stock, it's going to be a stock pickers, you know, this, this whole, the Fed asset bubble concept where rising tides raise all boats. We're kind of coming to an end of that period. And now you're going to go back to getting paid for what you know, as, a path, as opposed to just pay, getting paid to ride the wave, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is good news, I think. Well, yeah, yeah, it is for you because <laughs> you've got the requisite skills to do excellent in that environment. And so I'm glad that you're my friend. If I need a loan, I'll know who to call here pretty soon. <laughs> with that said, I, you've been super generous with your time, your knowledge of just history and the markets. And I love the, the way that you see the world and the way that you do things. So, and, and, I, and I just appreciate your friendship. So thanks for spending the time. I know you got a lot of bigger fish to fry out there. So uh, I wish well, you the best that's great. It was great. And you know, I just would encourage people to be positive. You know, we, we will come through and there will be opportunities. And you know what? We're going to be there to take advantage of when they uh, when they present themselves, right? Exactly. Yep. Keep 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 buying the report, Timmy. <laughs> <laughs>